All right, everyone, so welcome back. Uh, today we are going to shift our attention over to the uh, e-commerce plugin, uh, the ability now to start uh, selling products. We've had all of this time where we've built a foundation so that we can so that we can um, start to have a good website to sell products and now we're at that point. We've gone through part one of the class, uh, laid a lot of foundation, uh, talking about intermediate concepts in this class, and then we're gonna go on to talk about even more complex stuff as as our time goes on. So I'm going to um, have us set ourselves up again as we usually do where we create where we recreate our site uh, so let's go ahead and um, you want to uh, double click your WAMP server icon on your desktop double click WAMP server you'll see that that's running in the corner and I'm getting this all from my handout version 2 of the handout in the handout I've also got that now what we need to do is to set that rewrite module. Remember, we were changing our permalinks so that we can have pretty links previously. In order for that to work, we have to set the rewrite module in Apache. It's in the notes, but I'm going to do it right away now so that I don't forget. So you should have your WAMP server running. And click on the little W down on the bottom right. Click on it once and then you're going to go to Apache and then Apache modules. Again, that's in the notes. I'm doing a little bit earlier than what my notes say. It doesn't matter when you do it really, but I'm just doing it as soon as possible here to be on track. Apache, Apache modules, and then scroll down to find rewrite module. So alphabetically there, you want to go down to the R's rewrite module. Be careful that you don't click request module. It's right next to it. And you only need to do this on Windows, remember, on WAMP. Um, so rewrite module under Apache modules on the Apache menu. Click on that. You will see the feedback is that you will see the little W possibly change colors from red maybe to orange and then to back to green. So it should go back to green at this point. We need to do that in this room because remember these computers forget everything we do to them if you're on your own computer at home you do it once and it'll remember you're on a real server Bluehost, GoDaddy, whatever you don't have to do this it's already set up on the real server so I hope that on a future version of WAMP server they automatically activate this because it's so useful it is in my notes uh, notes for version 2 which is in the folder I'll remind you where but um, that should go back to green. Now I need to create the database. So you can click on the W again and select here the shortcut PHP my admin. So click on PHP my admin and that should open up your web browser and it'll simply go to localhost slash PHP my admin. It's coming this way, Armin. So, uh, all right. So here we are in PHP, my admin. Again, as usual, we're going to create a database. Uh, so at the top there, go ahead and click databases. Name it whatever you want. I'm just sticking with WordPress. And click create. For a few of you, you've figured out that if you, create, if you create multiple databases, you can have multiple WordPress installations. So if you put in a folder into your www folder of a WordPress site and you put in another one, they need separate databases. And so here is how you create them. And also for some of us, I haven't mentioned it for the class and it's not on any of my notes, but if you make a note of this, let's say for whatever reason you need to start all over on your home computer. And on uh, my home computer, you know, I, uh, I go home and I'm going to start all over and I go to databases and I go back to the screen here and I'm trying to create 
a database called WordPress, and I click Create, it'll give me a big scary message, can't create database. Now it seems that people stop reading at that sentence there, because the next sentence says, database exists. So I see that with a lot of people. Database exists, right there. That's why some of you, when you've been trying to create the WordPress database over and over, and you keep getting an error, don't forget to read the final words of the sentence, which says that the database exists. It's right there. If I want to delete that database to start over, it's not so obvious, but don't do this. Just make a note. You can select the database from this screen, and you've got drop. That's the technical term for delete a database. You want to start all over and reuse the name of a database. You can select it and drop it, and then you can retype it and get a new database. Yes? Um, I have a question. I'm trying to restart from scratch, like you were mentioning, uh, but they're saying that ports are in use. For example, it mm -hmm. says 888. Mm -hmm. cannot choose 888. must choose 889, or something else because it says that it's in use, and I'm like, I'm remembering something about that when I've helped you. Uh, I'll have to look during the lab time to confirm or the break. I don't remember exactly why. That's only something I've kind of seen over on MAMP because MAMP uses the ports 8888 and 8889 and not WAMP. So we'll check during the, the break in a moment. But um, I think it was something about checking... Um, that you were using MAMP instead of MAMP Pro or starting the servers? Wasn't it that we clicked the button to start the servers? It wasn't automatically started, if that rings any memory. Uh, again, I'll... Mm -hmm. So in our case, uh, we've got a database. I've acted rewrite module. I need to put the uh, last week's work into the folder. So again, we can open up computer window, and then network location, classroom data, and then campus WordPress 2. Last week's work is right there. 0302, and what I need to do is get that into my folder of the www folder. So I'm going to open another window. I'm going to leave that one I'm going to leave that one there for a moment. So I've got my network folder here. I will open another window, another computer window. And on this new computer window, then we go to local disk C. And then WAMP folder. WWW folder. So from my network folder, you, you want to copy last week's work copy it over to your WW folder, and then we will proceed. So we've done this several times before. It's in the handouts. Uh, you're dragging f a copy of last week's work over to our WW folder. So I'm going to close the network folder and I'll leave that WW folder open. Now I'll go back to my web browser and we'll go to the address HTTP colon slash slash localhost slash um, 2013 or 2016. I lost a few years there. 2013-0302 and that's the name of the folder that we just dropped into the www folder of course my handouts say 2016-0101 which of course doesn't make sense because we don't have a folder called 2016-0101 and then we've got slash installer.php you can press enter there and then you should see the the uh, duplicator plugin welcome screen We don't want to add www because it's not a website, it's on localhost. Alright, so on this screen that we've seen before, we are going to select 
um, localhost for host, that's the same. Name is the name of the database, which is WordPress. User is root, and password is nothing. You want to test that, and I get a couple of successes. And then I'll select, I read all the warnings, and run development. the name of the database you just created.
All right, so uh, I plugged in my details. Here it uh, seems to be on track. It's saying you've got your old project and it's coming to the new project. So um, you can just click Run Update. And that'll process a few things behind the scenes. Uh, everything looks good here. I don't have any errors or warnings. If you did, uh, we, we should look at them. But again, this because we've got this testing site, it's not such a big deal. Warnings we can sort of proceed with, and errors we definitely need to fix. But the only things we need to do here are uh, save permalinks and then security cleanup. So click save permalinks, number two. And we're going to log in with my login information, which we've been using before, which is admin for the username, and then uh, password, capital P, for the password. It's obviously the worst usernames and passwords that we can use, but just for our purposes, we're using them, and then I'll address changing them and creating other users a little later. Admin and password, capital P, click login. The only thing you need to do on permalinks here is confirm that it still remembers post name. Remember what I said about the default naming structure? Plain is the worst one to use, so we set it to post name previously. Almost any one of these is good, except for plain and numeric. That's almost the same thing. We don't want numeric addresses. It remembered from last week, but just to confirm, we still want to click Save. I didn't change anything but just confirm that you've got post name and click save changes. I save that. I've got a duplicator tab where I was at and a new permalink settings. I'm going to close the permalinks setting tab <coughs> or window so that it goes back to the duplicator tab. I did step two. I saved the permalink. I confirmed it and I saved it. I assume we did step three. Step four. Click step four to clean up the temporary files. There's a bunch of little files left over once you do this whole resurrection. You want to clean them up, so click security cleanup. Confirm this, just click OK. And it's OK, let's clean up. We've got uh, some reserved files that are still hanging around. So we've got this cleanup tab. Click delete reserved files. It should give you some feedback at the top that says it removed all of these files, except for the zip file. My notes say that you, to accomplish this final step, you need to go back to your folder, your folder where your project is at, double click the project folder, the one with the date, and you should see a zip file with a huge name and a little zip folder. If you're not seeing it with the zipper, it's the wrong one. Be careful. You need to make sure you're, you need to make sure you're in the folder, in the WW folder. When you see the zip file, delete it. So just click it once and then delete on the keyboard. And that's our step four file cleanup. We want to get rid of the uh, leftover remnants of resurrecting the site. I'm going to close the duplicator tab now. I don't need it anymore. It actually doesn't exist anymore. And I'll stay here on my tools. I'll click on Dashboard and then we'll get started. Anyone need any help getting to this point? So we've done this a few times together. It's all in the handouts. And I, I'm going to scare you. I'm going to say, we're going to try next week. You're going to do this on your own we're going to see next week, because after seeing it, what, seven times together? Let's see if on the eighth time you can do it. We'll see next week. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're all here. We've got our site. We're on dashboard. Uh, I lost that somehow. I closed the um, <coughs> here, and there was nothing that was and then up on the
Okay, so the big idea today is that we're now going to introduce the means to create um, uh, the whole shopping cart system. That's what we're going to focus our attention the rest of the, of the days of this class. Uh, one little thing that caught my eye, however, updates. We were here a week ago and now it's telling us there's more updates. So refer to the lecture from last time about my stance on updates, remember. And just to take a quick look, you don't have to do this, but I guess the update is a kismet. There's a brand new version, 3.1.8. I would read the details, 100% compatibility, so it's not a big deal. I'm not going to do any updates, but remember from last week we talked about the whole concept of updates. Um, let's... I gave this last week. Um, I don't know if everyone got it, so I'll show it again. Um, I've got handout number five inside of the folder. Um, that's what we're going to focus on today. So, if you didn't get sheet number five last week, let's get it right now. Go back to your computer window. You can minimize everything. Go back to computer. Open classroom data. <coughs> Open our class folder. Campos WordPress 2. And you want to drag a copy from my folder to your desktop or flash drive. Campos e-commerce sheet 5 e-commerce plugin. Drag it to your desktop. The printer's off for the moment. You can print it during the next break. But this is what we're going to look at together now. So drag number 5 and then close the network and open the PDF. So once you copy e-commerce sheet 5, double click it to view it. We'll look at it as, a, as an overview, and then we'll get into it. Um, this is mentioned on other handouts, but I also mention it right at the top. Sometimes what happens is that I'm working on the project, I close everything, how do I get back to it? Uh, it's here, and it's also in some other instructions. But you can always get back to your project by going back to localhost slash the name of your project slash wp-admin. <coughs> My handout there specifically says localhost slash WordPress. Our project is not called that. Our project is called localhost slash 2016-0302. Every week it's got a different name because every week is a different week. And so my handout, if you type that literally and you get a not found, you should not be confused. You should not be confused because our site is literally not called WordPress. It's called 2016-0302. And next week, it will be called 2016-03-09, right? So just because my handout says something exactly like that, you have to think one side, one step ahead about why it might not work. If you did not call your project folder WordPress, then it won't work. Our project folder is called 2016-03-02. But the rest says wp-admin. That will always take you back to the login screen of your site. Right there, look at that, wp-admin of my site. So I have it right at the top there to remind you, but it is in other handouts, and I have been mentioning it. The big idea here is that we need to install a plugin, and then we need to configure it and use it. This one sheet handout gets you started, and then this day and the next days we get into a lot of detail, because now we're going to be entrepreneurs. We've got a website. Well, think about this. You're a database administrator. You're a web designer, and now you're going to be an e-commerce guru with all of the things we're learning here. And the way this will work is we're going to add a plugin. It's named there. 
We have all of these brand new features that will be added to our WordPress. We're going to look at all of them. And we've got some recommendations of what to do, what to fill in, and then we're going to start to add products. So once we've got this foundation of one month of work, a week and a, a month and a week, now we can get to this part. So uh, first thing, we need to be logged in, which we are. Click plugins and then add new. Do you see you've got a plugins menu item? You can hover over or click and then select add new. We've talked about some plugins before. Now we need a new one. I've got here uh, in the search box type WP e commerce, no quotation marks. You should see a search plugins box at the top right. WP e commerce. I'm sorry, WP space e commerce. I have uh, 803 results. As I've talked about before, how do you pick the right plugin? Well, you look at the number of reviews, ratings, how old is it, when was it last updated, is it compatible with your version? Because the one we're going to be talking about here is three and a half stars. But there's another one over here that sounds even better, four stars, a perfect five stars. Why are we not choosing the perfect five star plugin instead of this three one? <coughs> Only 40 people are using it in the world, and there's only one review, probably the, theme, the plugin developer's mom. So what we want is this one still because it's got a lot of reviews, a lot of installations, more than 60,000. It was updated two months ago. And remember the whole speech last time about the age of plugins and themes. And there's other ones. That one's also got five stars, but it's one review. This one has no stars. So lots of e-commerce solutions out there. And yes? Do you have an opinion on WooCommerce? That's what I was about to say. Uh, so. This is the one we're going to use in this class. Free, powerful plugin, etc. It has three and a half stars. There's another big competitor to this, which is WooCommerce. If you search WooCommerce, you don't have to do this, but I'll show you. WooCommerce, there it is right here. It's got four and a half stars with more than a thousand more reviews than the one I'm talking about in this class. And it was updated a week ago. Now, comparing those two simply by these hard numbers, this would seem like the much better alternative. And both are viable plugins, WP Commerce and WooCommerce. The thing is that to, for a beginner, I think WP Commerce is going to give you better results. It is more straightforward, out of the box, it works a lot faster, whereas with, w, with WooCommerce, you're going to download it, and right away it's going to say, please also download this plugin, and this plugin, and this plugin. And then please set these settings, and these settings, and these settings. WooCommerce, honestly, is more powerful. But not a lot of you will need that kind of power. Not a lot of you will need really advanced things such as product grouping. That you're going to sell one product, and you have to then also buy another product. Uh, advanced cross-selling and upselling and uh, for sales and all of these advanced things. Not all of you are going to need that. So you won't need WooCommerce, which honestly out of the box is much more complex than, Woo than WP Commerce. Yes? How do you uh, present that to the client? Kind of the, way, the same way that I'm, that I'm saying, and you also need to know what that client needs. You would need to educate yourself on the pros and cons of both. Since they are both free, I'm going to set myself up on the weekend with WAMP server, create a fake test site, play with both. See which I like better, see which I understand better. And then, based on that, make a decision for the client to, say, to guide them to one or the other. Both of them are viable de decisions. Both of them are viable plugins. It's going to depend on the client. I've got a few clients that use WP Commerce. I've got a few clients that use WooCommerce. It depends on their product. So as we use this one, and I compare and contrast the both, you might be able to figure out which is best. Yes? And what about down the line of, say, like in a year or two, and things are more complicated? How hard is it to switch from like WP e-commerce to WooCommerce? Unfortunately, it is a bit hard. All the plugins that, are, that purport to do uh, uh, commerce, so WP Commerce, 
WooCommerce, Shopify, etc., Magento, Business Catalyst, all of them, they all think they can do it the best. And unfortunately, none of them make it very easy to switch from one platform to another. They want you to go to their plugin, stay on their plugin because they're the best, quote unquote, and then it's kind of hard to take it out from one to the other. And I've dealt with that. I had a client that was on a powerful system, but it was very expensive monthly. So they wanted to move over to something else. I forget what it was. And it was a bit of a challenge to transfer it over. So I'll talk about that. Short answer, unfortunately, is you kind of have to pick early on which of them to work with, but you don't know which one of them to work with, so it's a catch-22. Okay, and that would be that would that would tie up a lot of loose ends, but that might be way too much work. Okay. So it is possible to to transfer your data from one because this is all in a database. It might be it might be possible with some work to then move it from one plugin to the other. But of course, there's always the start all over solution, which is you know way too much hassle sometimes. <coughs> So out of the box, I think uh, WP Commerce works better, and the concepts that we will learn here will apply also to WooCommerce. But we sort of need a lot of setup to get ourselves up and running, and uh, WooCommerce is often, you know, way too much stuff for um, for early on. And notice there's all of these ancillary ones: uh, WooCommerce AJAX product filter, WooCommerce AJAX search. <coughs> essential kit for WooCommerce, multi-vendor. So there's like a cottage industry of people making uh, plugins for WooCommerce. Um, some of them better quality th than others. Uh, so for this class we, we're going to focus on, on this one, WP Commerce. And because we're working with a test site, it might not be, be a big deal if eventually we figure out this is not the best one. But once we get WooCommerce, if you go that route, uh, you'll see, oh, it's not so different. It's got new screens and new abilities, but I kind of can figure it out. Uh, so here, go ahead and click Install Now. My instructions are saying once you find it, click Install Now. Eventually, it'll download, it'll install and then you have to remember to activate it. You can have multiple plugins installed, but they don't necessarily need to be active. You can have them hanging around. They're not going to do, do anything on your site, but you do want to activate them eventually. Take a moment for that to happen, then click Activate. The thing about plugins, as I've mentioned before, is there doesn't seem to be any consensus about how to present, how an author presents their plugin to you. Um, WooCommerce is a complex, I mean, uh, WP Commerce is a complex plugin. So, as my notes say, we have a bunch of new features. You might get a little pop up that says there's new features. Just dismiss that for the moment. You can see all of your installed plugins inside of the plugins window, installed plugins, that's where we're at. And it says we've got WP Commerce. This is where we can go get documentation to read how it works and to go get premium support. This is where you see people make money off of these things. They give the software away for free. How do I make it do my exact thing? That you you can read the documentation on your own, or you might pay for premium support. And it really ranges $5, $40, $90. We're going to use the completely free version of it. I've got a couple of clients that are running the completely free version and it's working great for them. No extra investment in the plugin. But what this plugin has does is it's added a brand new item to our WordPress. This was not here before. Products. We'll look at this in a moment. Here's where we can manage our products and categories and coupons and all of that. We'll look at that in a moment. We've also got, if you click on Dashboard, whenever you log in for the first time to WordPress, 
you're going to see the dashboard and one of the items in the dashboard a couple of items if you scroll down you will see sales by month and then also sales by quarter and sales summary you're also going to see a WP e-commerce news what's new and all of that but as soon as you log in, you're going to be seeing this sales summary, current month, total income and such. You can look up your sales, sales for the last four months, for the last quarter. So that's something new that gets added to your, to your WordPress. Do you also notice under Dashboard, you have Store Sales. Now it's going to look very boring at the moment, but click on Store Sales. It's under Dashboard. Again, it's very boring, but at this place it would show you an order ID, a customer, the amount, and their status of the order, the date, and the tracking ID. So it would show you this is your master list of all sales and such. It's all downloadable as an Excel spreadsheet file, so I can download it, and that's a pretty universal format. I can download it and, and then integrate it with QuickBooks or whatever. Um, out of the box, this plugin doesn't integrate with those other systems, and even WooCommerce out of the box doesn't. You have to add extra plugins to do that. And with WooCommerce, for example, those extra plugins are not free. I don't know off the top of my head how much they cost, but this is a, is a common thing. These plugins will work really, really well, but you need one extra little thing, and then you might have to pay a little bit to get that working. This is the screen where I would see all of that, where I would then click to view all of the orders status, where I would print out invoices, where I would look at if, they're, if the bank has charged them properly, all of that stuff. And then this is what I said now. At this point, now you're going to be responsible for people's personal information. This plugin now will be capturing whatever information that you ask. It'll, it can be editable, it can be configurable, and it will store this information on your website. It's not going to store the credit card information unless you choose that. I wouldn't, because then now you're on the hook for credit card fraud. This will at least capture and store the information of their home address and their email and phone and such, which is of course very important information. But if you've got a digital product that you're selling, you don't need to ask for a person's address and that sort of thing. And that's all configurable. We will see that. We also have a new item here under the dashboard, WP e-commerce licensing. You can add extra features to WP Commerce, and this is where you activate those features after you pay for them, you register them, and you get new, new features. Click on Pages. We've also got some new pages here. We've got a Products page, Checkout page, Transaction Results page, Your Account page. We can rename those, of course. We can show them. We can hide them. But this is, uh, this is going to be a screen that's going to show all your products. I don't like that generic name. I, later on, I want to call it, you know, My Shop or The Shop or something. We can do that. We've got a checkout screen, transaction results. I don't like that name. I can change that later. And if a person creates an account, they're going to have their own Your Account screen that has their data. These brand new pages have been added to my site, but most likely they are not accessible by the menu. Because remember, we've got a theme, and it's got a menu, and we had to design our menu, but the menu does not automatically update with new pages. I want to see my brand new pages on my website, so we need to add them to the menu. We did this previously. Let's go edit our menu. Hover over Appearance, Menus. That's what our menu structure looks like. We've got Home, About Us, Contact, Buy Now, and Amazon. I don't want that link anymore because I'm going to be selling products on my own site. So how do you delete an item from the menu? I don't see a remove. Click on the down arrow. 
Click right. on the triangle first, the down arrow, and then, oh, there we go, remove. So go ahead and remove the Amazon link. And on the left side, it shows that we've got some new pages. Products, your account, transaction results, checkout. How do I add them here into my menu? I think I heard someone say, click on products, your account, transaction results, and then click add to menu. So you're selecting the items you want to add to the menu, and then you add to menu, they all get thrown on the menu, which then you can reorganize. Because what I want is all of these are on the same top root level of my menu. They will all be visible. I don't want products visible until someone clicks the drop down arrow. And that we can do that by simply dragging products to the right a little bit so that it becomes indented. I'm sorry, not products, your account. Your account under products, transactions under your products. Be careful because you might accidentally put it under your account. What I mean is if I did that, checkout is now a sub-menu item of a sub-menu item. You might not want that. Be careful. And it can be finicky sometimes. I'm dragging it over and I want to put it to the left here and it's not jumping. You might have to kind of wiggle it around until, you've, until the highlighting appears where you want it. Let's do that. Let's move these into sub-items of products page. These will not be visible until someone clicks the drop-down button for products. Let's click Save Menu, and then Visit Site. Save that menu, Visit Site. And now on the left side, Home About Contact Blog, Products Page, drop-down arrow. If you click the drop-down arrow, your account transaction results checkout. If you click on products page, there are no products. And you can explore the other ones also. What's under your account? Nothing because there's no purchase history. Transaction results? Nothing. There's no transaction and checkout. There's nothing to, to check out with. But all of these pages were created for us. They have built-in functionality of displaying products, displaying shopping carts, etc. In the old days, if I was going to design this before WordPress and such, I would have a hard time setting all of this up because this requires complexity, the database, dynamic code, often PHP, JavaScript, and such. This is just built in. I've got a brand new page that will automatically show all my products. If I add five products, they'll show up there. If I add 40 products, they'll all show up there. I can, of course, customize it, but now, here, we're Amazon. We've got the ability to now have products and take credit card information and such when we finish setting that up and actually sell products. Real, digital, services, goods and services, we can sell anything now. Solicit donations, etc. So is everyone at this point, did you get, uh, manage to get your products page like that? I'm going to go back to the dashboard. So I've been showing here number six. We've got a dashboard, store upgrades and sales and such. We've got products um, category. We've got some new pages. And this last one that we'll spend some good amount of time looking at right now is settings. We've got a bunch of settings for our shop, and we should do this early on, and then we don't have to deal with it much. We need to set up the basic settings of our, of our store. So if you hover over settings, you have a brand new item at the bottom, store. Go ahead and go to settings and then store. And we're going to do these things here where I've got the setup here. We're going to look at these various tabs, general, admin, etc.
etc. And then create products. So again, this, this is going to be kind of technical, a little boring, but very important to set up because we want a properly set up store and then we'll start adding products. You've got all of these tabs within this screen. You should be under the store screen under settings and now you've got general admin taxes, all of this stuff. So this is where I come back again. Are you sure you want to be the next Amazon? Here are all the tools to be the next Amazon, but then you have to decide because now you're going to need to deal with taxes and shipping and collecting payments and marketing and all of that. But it's not so complicated as we'll see together. First step, we need to set our country. Where is our primary business location? So all the countries are listed here. It's alphabetical. You want to scroll down to find USA, or you can click. Here's a shortcut. If you click on select country and type U, it'll jump down to the U's, and you should see USA. And specifically, California, most likely. Most likely, this is your base of operations, and uh, you want to set that unless you have some advanced features. Sometimes people are going to ask for advanced things, and I won't have an answer because I don't have all the answers. Uh, I can give you experience. I can give you answers from our experiences of my company, but sometimes people have very specific things, and I have to say early on, I'm not a tax guru. I'm not a business guru. I can give you experiences personally and business-wise, but you will still need to consult with your tax preparer, your CPA, or whoever you trust, lawyer, etc. And I can point us to various web resources to look this stuff up. Uh, because, you know, people sometimes create a Delaware-based company to avoid taxes and all of that. I'm just setting this up uh, on generic terms, and you have to figure out what's best for you. Such as, are you selling your product to every country in the world, all 200 countries? Um, that's going to require that you ship your product off to Albania and that you pay for that shipping. Are you taking that into account when you're selling your product? So I'm going to say, just to kind of get started, I'm only going to ship my product to the US. I want to only ship to the US. Instead of turning off all of these check marks, click None. So now we're not targeting any country. And now scroll down to find USA. my product is being targeted to the USA market. Maybe I want to ship to USA, Canada, and Mexico. Great. Check those off, and you'll sell to those territories. What does this do? So. That's related to showing uh, products in the proper currency and also letting people know about international shipping and such. Keep stock in cart for X. Have you ever been to a website, an e-commerce website, and you add the uh, item to your cart, you're about to check out, and you think, uh, maybe I should pay the mortgage this month. And so you don't buy the product, you leave the website, you come back later after payday, and the, and the item is still in your cart waiting for you. That's what that is saying keep the item in the person shopping cart for X amount of time. So if, you've, if you're, we'll see this later, we can set stock um, quantities. Let's say I've got seven items to sell, seven unique items, uh, seven copies of an item, and someone adds it to their cart. It'll take it away from someone else buying it, because obviously someone's about to buy it. It won't let eight people buy an item if only seven are available. If you set this to a long date, such as one week, that item will stay in the person's shopping cart idle until one week later, <coughs> then it goes back to the rest of the pool of people that can buy it. So I'm bringing this up because you need to decide what you want here. Perhaps let, leave only one day for your product to stay in their cart. If they don't buy it today, it's someone else is going to buy it tomorrow. You can put uh, whole numbers, fractional numbers, also days, weeks, hours. Again, other shopping cart solutions might be more advanced in that I might want to set this per product. This is being set to all products. So just think about setting that to whatever you want. I'm going to leave it alone. 
Don't worry about use hierarchical product category. Leave that alone. Currency, USA dollar, that should be good. Uh, that's your base price of currency. If you are, let's say you're creating an e-commerce site to sell products in Mexico, you want to select that currency. Uh, other countries of the world write their currency symbol in a different way. If you want to change that, you can. I'll leave that alone. Other countries of the world also write their separators differently, which I still don't get. Why would you use a comma for cents, Europe? So um, you can change those if you'd like. If you don't know what it means, just leave them. And the only thing that I changed, which was very important, was the base country and target market. Go ahead and save. Now let's go to the admin tab of the settings. If you've got a digital product that you're selling, let's say you composed a song and you want to sell that mp3 to people, they need to download it. Let's say you created a video, you have video lectures, motivational speeches that you're selling, you can sell that too, you need to download the file. Here, the question then, these two questions, and these three questions relate to that. Max downloads per file. So let's say you wrote, you compose that song, you're selling the mp3, they have the link, they get an email automatically that says click here to download. They downloaded it. They can only download it once. What if their computer crashes, they lose everything? That song that they bought, they want to download it again, you're only letting them download it once until they have to pay again. That may be too strict. You have to decide on this. In any way, if you're not even selling digital products, this doesn't matter. But let's say I'm going to give people three chances. Whatever happens, they lose the original file, they have two more chances to still download it. Three in total. One is the default, which I think is too strict because things happen. Uh, they don't back up, people don't back up and then they want the file again, here's three chances to get it. Yes? That relates to the second question. Oh. Lock IP right here. So, let's say, a per let's say I had it down to one. And a person was at their friend's house, and they bought my song from their friend's house. Then they lost the file, they wanted to go back to their home, they wanted to download it. Let's say it had three possible downloads. Uh, options and I said yes lock IP what that will do is you can the person can only download the file again from the original computer from their friends computer an IP address is basically your address on the internet just like you've got an address for your home you've got an address on the internet an IP address and so here WP Commerce will make a note of that. John downloaded this song at this address, 1.2.7, whatever. And now they're trying to download it at 2.7. whatever. It won't let them. I do not recommend to select ever lock downloads to IP because I, we are at the beck and call of our service providers ATT, Time Warner, Cox, whatever. They assign us an IP and they change them once in a while without telling us. It doesn't matter. It's happened before. It'll happen again. So even if a person downloaded the file from their home computer and you have yes there, next time at t changes their, their whole pool of IP addresses for a neighborhood, now the person can't download it anymore. <laughs> so I would not lock it to IP. That's way too strict. MIME types, don't worry about it really. Yes, result is good. No result is advanced. Don't worry about it. Store admin email. Over on our settings, on our plain settings of general for WordPress, we've saved an email address of who is the administrator of the site. Now that we've got also a shopping cart feature, We've got an admin email which borrows it from the basic WordPress settings. Admin notifications will be sent here. Whenever a product is sold or returned or someone um, cancels a product or when you're running low on stock, you'll get an email to this email address. 
you could change it if you want. Let me confirm something here. I don't think you can um, put more than one. I have to double check this. Uh, I'm not sure if you can put more than one address. It didn't seem to complain that I put two, but that doesn't necessarily mean it'll work. For the moment, just assume that there's only one administrator email until I look it up. Um, but anything related to the store will be sent to that email address, which can be different than your basic <coughs> WordPress setting. Oh, no, yeah. oh, no. oh, no. Some systems take a semicolon to separate them, and some take a comma. So we'll, we should look it up to confirm. Then we've got the T and C's, terms and conditions. You see this all the time. You visit an e-commerce website, and either it is subtle or overt. Have you been to a shopping cart where you're trying to buy something, and you have to turn on a check mark that says, I've read the terms and conditions, and then I can buy? That's what that's about. If you fill anything here, the person needs to fill in I mean, the person needs to agree that they've read it before buying. You may be selling a product that, you know, you need to wash your hands of when someone buys it. So there's TNCs. Yes? There's standard sometimes when you have a company conditions, you have to scroll down all the way through and see you just put a check mark. Mm -hmm. Other ones, you can just add a check mark without doing that. I think uh, the better ones are that you have to scroll down before accepting the terms. This one, I don't believe it has that. It only just, you know, you read the first word and you click agree and that's it. The better ones are that you have to scroll through it so that, you know, you cover yourself more in case someone gets mad and you say, well, you read the terms, you scroll to the bottom. This doesn't have that feature. I don't think even WooCommerce has that feature, but that's a common thing now. Well, in this case, let's say I've got Victor's Bakery, and uh, I can put some terms here, such as no returns. I don't want your half-eaten bagel back, <laughs> so no returns. I could also say, um, how's that? How do you usually word that? You're, it's uh, no refunds. No return. Yeah, no refunds. No returns. Oh, <laughs> You guys have a lot of good ideas. No returns, no refunds, buyer beware, caveat mTOR, etc. So what I'm getting at is you could also do uh, items are manufactured in a facility that also handles, you know, the allergen warning that you see more and more. Manufactured in a facility that also handles nuts or whatever it is. We can look this up. The point is, what do I write here? That's going to depend on your company. I'm just writing some stuff here. The person will have to agree that they read it before they can buy the product. They technically don't need to read it. They can just click the check mark and move on. And all of this stuff regarding legalities, it's there to help you as best as possible be protected against you know frivolous lawsuits and all of that. Again, are you sure you want to be the next Amazon? Amazon's got a whole stable of lawyers that are covering everything. You, now yourself, are going to have to make your website, sell your products, keep up with stock, have good security, and be a lawyer. So, I'm not a lawyer, so what I can do is do a quick search. Uh, term E-commerce terms and conditions generator template um, you know these various terms e-commerce terms and conditions generator I want to find a generator for free or for paid that will cover my particular needs my particular T's and C's so what I'm writing there is not gonna apply to most people it's from my fictional Victor's Bakery you're going to need to educate yourself here. Maybe ask a lawyer friend and um, get some terms and conditions for your product. It can be anything you want. That might not be the best way to write it. That, um, that handles allergens. Um, 
right? Uh, that can be as big as you want. What will happen is uh, when we get to that point, the checkout box, it will be, uh, I have agreed to the terms and service, terms and conditions. And then they can click on it to view the full terms. Next, under Customer Purchase Receipt, the customer will get an email, a generic email that tells them what they've purchased. Where is it coming from? Here it's not filled in. You would fill in whatever you want here or nothing, but I recommend you do fill it in. I'm going to assume I have victorsbakery.com for real, and I'm going to have sales at victorsbakery.com. This assumes that I have an email set up for this. Okay, I don't have that. So I can do victorsbakery at gmail.com, and I can go get a Gmail address. That's not that professional, however. Most of the time when you get emails from a real company, they are not at Gmail, they are not at Yahoo, they are not at Cox, they are at the name of the company because they are not cheapskates. They bought an actual domain and they can create an email address attached to their domain. That's professional. You want to do that. You often also see no reply at something.com you need to go off to GoDaddy or Bluehost or wherever you've got your site and create that email address. And technically, if you're going the no-reply method, you don't need to create one because you're never going to reply to those addresses. You could create a real address like that, and once in a while when someone does reply to that, because even though it says no-reply, people do reply sometimes, you might then get those emails and actually deal with them. But how many of you have ever replied to those emails that say, no reply? No one, want, no one wants to admit it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so here we're covering the bases, just in case. Where's this coming from? <coughs> it's you know, it's going to be blank. I want it to say anything I want. Victor's Bakery sales team. That doesn't sound so friendly. Victor's Bakery sales notes. Anything you want. People uh, nowadays, these Web 2.0 companies are very friendly, and uh, you see all of these kinds of terminology rather than the classic, you know, sales or uh, you know, stoic language. So, so many of these now that are very, very friendly. And here's the message that is sent to people. Now, right above this, there are these various keywords. <coughs> Thank you for purchasing with shop name. There's a keyword here that will automatically <coughs> replace itself with your shop name. So if right now you're Victor's Bakery, and in a few months you're John's Bakery, this will automatically update itself to that. Those keywords inside of the percent symbols um, change as necessary. Thank you for purchasing with Victor's Bakery. Any items to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. So you can edit all of this. Especially, for example, any items that can be downloaded can be downloaded using the links on this page. It's going to send the person an email with links if, you, if they bought a digital product. I'm not selling digital products on my Victor's Bakery, so I'll take that out. This is, this is optional, but I'm going to take it out because I'm not selling digital products. Any items to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. All prices include tax and postage, packaging, etc. You ordered these items. It will automatically make a little table that displays a product list of what they bought, the total shipping that they paid, and the total price of everything that they bought. That can be customized a bit by selecting up here. I also want to send the purchase ID. That's the, you know, the tracking number. I also want to show uh, a little questionnaire, find us, how did you find us, and it'll ask through Facebook, word of mouth, etc. That's not so customizable, and that might be useful to kind of gather where are your, where is your traffic coming from? Where did people buy, hear about you to buy your product? The actual design of this, again, is not that customizable, um, there's no screen anywhere here that I can choose how that looks, but I can always 
Remember, as I said, you can always go to Appearance Editor, and if you pull back the curtain and edit the code, you will be able to edit any of this aspect of the shopping cart that is not a pretty button to click on. That, of course, requires your knowledge of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and PHP. Track and trace settings. Uh, this will send people tracking information. You can change how this looks. Again, it's just got generic terminology which you can change. I don't like that it says product tracking email. These are not products, these are you know yummy baked goods that I send people. So goodies, tracking email, whatever you want. And then save at the bottom. Is, is there an application inside this one to track it? It's going to attach itself, if you choose on another screen, to attach itself to a tracking system so that it then can process all of that. Yes, it is going to recommend one, but we, do, we can choose the ones we want. I'm going to click Save Changes. We've still got a few more screens to look at. Let's take a break at this point. And when we come back, we're going to jump, we're going to skip shipping and taxes for a moment, and we'll come back. But um, it's 1.45, let's take a break until 1.55. I'll turn the printer back on if you'd like to print sheet 5 or 4, and then we'll go on. <laughs>